And um, the first of the three cases I want to talk about is the reactive ethylene and hydrogen air turbulent lifted jets in a hot air co flow. And I'd like to acknowledge the work that was done largely by my postdocs and collaborators um, Chin Seng Yu, Ramana Sankara, Chin Fung, Lu, um, Professor Law, and, and myself. So, to help motivate this um, problem, we're, what we're, the reason we were interested in this configuration is to understand stabilization of lifted flames in a hot co flow. And in particular, what's the role of ignition in lifted flame stabilization? So if it's not just stabilized by edge flame or premix flame propagation or ignition, uh, where you can bring in the extra parameter of auto ignition, how, how does it play a role? And it, and it potentially has strong relevance to diesel engine combustion and lifted, uh, uh, lifted stabilization of diesel, uh, diesel flames. <clears throat> and so this movie here I'm going to show you on the top is actually something I got from, from Lyle Pickett at Sandia, and it shows the chemiluminescence uh, from a diesel liftoff stabilization of what he, I don't know what number two diesel fuel is, but ambient of 21% oxygen, the um, 850 Kelvin, and it's at 35 bar. And what I'll show you in the movie is that the flow issues from left to right, the ejector is here on the left, upper left corner, <coughs> and what you'll see in this blue outline, which is a leading edge of where they observe chemiluminescence, is this liftoff point. Um, and it, you'll see it bounce around a lot between about 20 and 30 millimeters downstream of the fuel injector. And every now and then what you'll see in the movie is a sporadic disconnected piece of flame or hot spot that quickly uh, either the flame moves up to the hot spot or the hot spot is convected and swept into the flame. So let me just show you the movie. And this is again a line of sight measurement, so it's not an instantaneous planar measurement. So it's sitting here about 40 to 50 millimeters downstream. And I'm trying, I don't know if my pointer is fast enough to capture. Oh, there's, there's one of the hot spots that, <coughs> good thing it finished on that one. Here's a hot spot. It looks to be disconnected. It could be out of, I mean, I don't know if it's out of plane or motion or, or if it's a hot spot, but it's disconnected from the main body. And then either the flame propagates to absorb that hot spot or the hot spot gets swept into the flame. And so you can see this kind of process repeat itself. Now, if you take the liftoff distance between the injector and the leading edge of where they observe chemiluminescence in the experiment, he's then plotted the liftoff height versus time. So this is a time trace of that fluctuating position. And if you just look at this trace, a couple things come to mind. First off, what you see is looks to be like a sawtooth-like pattern, where you have a rapid motion upstream followed by a slow, slower migration downstream. And it happens on a kind of an irregular basis. Now, while we can't currently access the conditions at, at 35 bar that they have in this diesel lifted jet plane, we can do calculations with DNS at atmospheric conditions in a much simpler fuel. This is an ethylene air jet plane, one of the simplest hydro, low hydrocarbon fuels, <coughs> and in a smaller um, slot burner configuration. So the domain size here is on the order of three centimeters in the axial direction, four centimeters in the transverse direction, and a very narrow slot of about six millimeters wide. This, and to resolve all of the Kolmogorov and the flame ignition scales required something like 1.3 billion grid points. We have a fairly high jet velocity, 200 meters per second, but diesel jets are, are even faster than that. We have a, a co-flow speed that's one-tenth as fast, uh, 20 meters a second, and this is a co-flow of hot air at 1550 Kelvin, which is above the ignition limit for ethylene. <coughs> the nozzle size here is two millimeters wide. Uh, fuel injectors are, I'm told, about even smaller. They're like half a, half a millimeter, or even. They're, they're, they're very small, but their flow rates are extraordinarily high. So in a real diesel injector, the Reynolds number is 10 times uh, bigger than what we are able to simulate here. It's, here, our, our jet Reynolds number is 10,000. And, and then we, we're looking at a fuel jet that's heavily diluted with nitrogen. So it's only 18% ethylene by volume. And it's a cold fuel jet at 550 Kelvin. And by diluting it so heavily, we've moved the stoichiometric mixture fraction of 
0.27 kind of inwards into this high, this boundary between the um, coke flow and the higher speed moving jet. Um, <clears throat> as I pointed out earlier, we started from a detailed uh, ethylene air chemical mechanism developed by uh, High at USC. Is that correct, Tinfeng? And then reduced by Tinfeng and, and, and Professor Law down to 22 species, 18 global reactions, and 201 steps. Uh, that we can incorporate in our DNS. And so this picture here on the right simply shows the, uh, let's see, what is it showing? I think it's showing the temperature, um, uh, the temperature and, and, and OH um, on top of that, where the OH is the, denoted by red and the, um, I, should, I should forget what it is actually, but anyway. Uh, it basically shows the structure of the lifted flame. And the one thing I want to point your attention to here in this DNS is that, first of all, there's not a single stabilization point in the spanwise direction, as one might expect. There's actually several uh, stable points of stabilization that are separated by about an integral scale apart in the spanwise direction. And they kind of act independently of one another when they're about an integral scale apart. The second point to note is that there are some isolated islands of high OH or high temperature separated from the main body of the flame. Okay, so let me quickly give you a sense of the dynamics of this lifted flame stabilization. The first movie I'm going to show you on the left is the mixture fraction scalar dissipation rate, the log of that, where white regions indicate very high dissipation rates uh, and orange are the low values. And you'll see that the dissipation rate in this jet flame aligns with the principal strain directions pretty much 45 degrees as you would expect in this type of, of, of jet configuration. On the right, what I'll show you is the temperature, uh, the animation of the temperature. And again, um, <clears throat> as in the previous static picture, you should notice that the flame is stabilized at multiple points in the spanwise direction. And every now and then, you'll see what looks to be a hot, hot spot disconnected from the main body of the flame. All right, so here is the mixing rate. Uh, on a log scale, and you can see these large sheet-like structures that are inclined at about 45 degrees along the principal strain direction. And here's the temperature. Uh, blue is denotes the cold ethylene fuel stream. Yellow denotes the hot 1550 Kelvin air stream, and red denotes the lifted flame uh, flame temperature. Okay, and so the beauty of one of the advantages of DNS is you have everything, uh, all of the scalar and velocity fields um, computed. And so shown here is the volume rendering of instantaneously of the 3D scalar dissipation rate on the left, the mixture fraction field where red is the fuel stream, blue is the oxidizer stream, the hydroxyl radical, which is what people measure in the lab, especially with laser induced fluorescence. <laughs> they get planar images of the, this is what denoted, usually denotes the flame. Uh, and then the two species on the right um, are actually ignition markers or evidence that there's some sort of auto ignition occurring. The first spe species here is hydro, hydroperoxy, HO2, and the second one is formaldehyde, the stable intermediate. <clears throat> and so you can see very clearly that there's a lot of HO2 and formaldehyde upstream of the hydroxyl radical indicating that there might be some reactions occurring upstream of the flame. Now, uh, from that data, we can take a slice of it somewhere in the spanwise direction, and we can take the usual uh, Faber uh, means or the RANS averages, which are shown in the top panel, top row of temperature OH, formaldehyde, and HO2. So you, you get the expected picture, which is um, temperature and OH kind of agree that in the sense that the mean uh, kind of the stabilization point is about six jet heights above, jet, uh, jet um, widths above the um, nozzle. And on the other hand, formaldehyde and HO2 have their peaks um, ahead of that upstream of the stabilization point. Uh, if you then take a slice, instantaneous slice, and don't average it, this is the picture you would see. Um, and shown here on top of the isocontour plots is a black line 
both in the brands and the instantaneous picture showing the stoichiometric mixture fraction line. So you can also quickly see that um, near the liftoff point, um, the flame stabilizes on the lead side, fuel lead side towards the hot oxidizer stream. <coughs> Now I'd like to focus your attention on one small piece of this, which is this lower left liftoff point. And let's zoom in and see what the physics are going on in, inside of that liftoff region. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the time evolution of OH at the stabilization point at that left branch, where we're following time uh, left to right in the top row and then continuing that in the bottom row left to right. And what I want to point out is that the con contour levels correspond to OH. The arrows are the velocity vectors, and the reddish black line, which is kind of hard to see, is the stoichiometric mixture fraction line. And what I'd like to point out is at 0.272 non-dimensional time, and then again at 0.748 non-dimensional time, you see, you see a, the emergence of a very faint uh, level of OH radical, which is upstream of the main body of the flame, which sits here at about six and a half, six um, jet heights. And what you see if you track that in time in very finely discretized time increments is that the strength of that hot spot increases in, in intensity um, on the lean side of the stoichiometric. And then it's, um, and, and it's basically following these large uh, coherent jet mixing structures as it's then convected downstream. And then subsequently, you see this happen again. Another um, hot spot forms, and then this process kind of repeats itself sporadically. We can take a closer look and more quantitative look at this by examining the displacement speed <coughs> of the flame, which is indicated by an ISO line corresponding to OH mass fraction of 5e e minus 4. This is somewhere about 4% of the peak value of OH which is a good indicator of the leading edge of the flame. You could have equally as well have applied a temperature isotherm or, or, or some other measure. But anyway, we need to delineate the isosurface marking, denoting the, the leading edge of that anchoring point. And if we do that, we compute the velocity of that front propagating in its, the direction normal to itself relative to the local gas velocity, u dot n, then we can define what, what here is the displacement speed originally put forth by Carl Gibson and, and uh, we've made modifications to that definition later on. <clears throat> and basically what it shows you is the balance between reaction rate and species diffusion. Where BJK is a diffusion velocity of species J uh, into, into K, uh, uh, the J species. <clears throat> and then modulating this balance between reaction and species diffusion is the gradient, magnitude of the gradient of the species mass fraction or temperature um, at that ISO line. And so a couple things to note uh, are that, that that species or scalar gradient vanishes at two points in an auto ignition process. It first vanishes at the point of thermal runaway when the gradient is, uh, when you have a Gaussian peak and the gradient is zero. So displacement speed is unbounded there. The second place that it vanishes is at the point where you've consumed all of the reactants. If, if everything, let's say you have a pocket that you, the last remaining burning pocket, as you burn that to a point, the gradient there vanishes as well. And so the displacement speed of that front also would be unbounded for a very large value since we're numerically discretizing this problem. <clears throat> Outside of those um, extreme points, if the displacement speed is of order unity, uh, such that reaction and, and molecular transport are, are balanced, then you are likely to have a deflagration or premixed flame um, locally. Whereas if the displacement speed is much larger, uh, then it's likely that you're simply looking at an ignition front that's spontaneous ignition front that's propagating down a um, temperature gradient or a gradient in, in, in spatial gradient in ignition delay time. So let's look at the statistics then from the DNS. So like the experiment where we looked at the time trace of the axial fluctuating position of the leading edge, this is what you see in the DNS. X over H, normalized by the jet height, is the 
position, instantaneous position of the stabilization point based on that OH threshold. And you see a characteristic sawtooth-like form in this function as well, where it comes down, it propagates upstream really quickly, and then it more slowly migrates downstream and kind of happens on, on an irregular basis, but you see the same kind of rapid migration upstream followed by a slower <coughs> movement downstream. Now, if I call your attention to the two times that I showed you the um, instantaneous images where we saw the formation of those little hot spots at point 0.2 and point 0.7, those are where those arrows are, we can now look at the displacement speed of the ignition or deflagration front. And you see that at, the, at, point, at that first point where we saw the ignition hotspot form, the displacement speed is well over 100 meters a second. That's way too fast for any sort of self-propagation due to balances between transport and reaction. And in fact, that's probably corresponding to when that flame or when that spot auto-ignited and thermally exploded, where you have, you know, in fact, it might be infinity, but because we're discretizing this, it's, it's only 100 meters a second. But then you quickly see it exponentially decay down to something that might be more akin to a, a, a setting up a deflagration wave down here at about 10 meters a second, which is plausible. <coughs> Uh, and then similarly, at later times, it does. You see the spiky behavior and displacement speed at, at very large numbers that indicate a spontaneous ignition front propagation, not a flame. The other thing I want to point out is the local gas velocity u dot n, uh, which is shown here by the red trace. And if you compare the integrated area under the red trace compared with the displacement speed shown by the blue trace, the gas velocity, the convective velocity, is pretty high in both the fuel jet as well as in the co-flow, which is at 20 meters a second. And so even if, if the, the displacement speed is coming down to a value that is representative of flame propagation, the flame can't propagate against that fast oncoming convective stream. And so it's being invected, it ignites, and then it's being invected downstream into the main body of the flame. And that pattern repeats. And so we don't see any particular role of dissipative molecular transport in this particular set of parameters. For the heavily, we're not fairly heavily diluted flame where we brought the stoichiometric mixture fraction inward into the faster moving stream. And, and there's just no time for these molecular transport processes to set up um, because before convection takes over. And you know, even if it wants to propagate upstream, it can't against this fast moving convection. <coughs> Um, uh, yeah, we can quantify that. We, I, don't, I don't think we have that here. Um, we've looked at the spectra, kinetic and scalar energy spectra, to make sure that we, have, we don't have any spurious um, you know, accumulation of energy at the high wave numbers. <coughs> okay, so in this particular case, advection and autoignition is what's helping stabilize this flame. And it's trying to propagate, so it's propagating into an autoignited mixture. A while ago, Lester Sue and Godfrey Mungle had, in a, in a non-reactive uh, co-flowing lifted jet, hypothesized about uh, stabilization processes and how they might tie in with the coherent jet structures and coherent jet mixing patterns. What we see here, then, is that kind of a modification of what they um, proposed, in that first we see ignition occurring in very lean mixtures at, in conditions of very low scalar dissipation rate where it's hot, it's sheltered, and the, and the radical pool can build up without being <coughs> dissipated out. Then we see that stabilization is invected uh, downstream by the high convective velocities. And then subsequently ignition occurs in another coherent jet structure and the process repeats itself. And this is, the caveat is, this is for where the convective velocity is greater than the displacement speed of, of, a, of a flame when you start to move the stoichiometric mixture fraction inward. Now, by comparison, we ran another set of numerical uh, calculations with hydrogen air, <coughs> jet flames in a hot cold flow. And here, um, most of it is similar, except that the cold flow velocity is, is lower. It's 10 meters a second. And second of all, we didn't dilute the hydrogen mixture as much. So, before, the ethylene was only 18% ethylene by volume balance as nitrogen. Here, it's 65% hydrogen, 35% nitrogen at 400 Kelvin. 
So the stoichiometric mixture fraction sits a little bit further out where it's more sheltered, it's hotter, uh, dissipation rates are lower. Here the hot, uh, cold flow temperature is 1100 Kelvin, again above the ignition limit. And uh, what I'm showing here in the renderings are the mixture fraction, scalar dissipation rate, and this is the hydroxyl radical in yellowish color coupled with the HO2, which is, as I said, a good ignition marker ahead of upstream of the hydroxyl radical. So this is now hydrogen air, not ethylene air. <coughs> and uh, we did a similar sort of analysis, but I, what I want to point, point out the difference between the two flames is if you now look at the axial movement fluctuation of the, of the lifted flame base, it doesn't have the sawtooth pattern, but we're, we're calling this a chain link fence pattern in the sense that you don't have a rapid motion upstream followed by a slower motion downstream, but in fact the, the movement upstream kind of looks the same as the movement back downstream across one cycle. And so we wanted to look more closely at what's happening here. And <clears throat> we did this again by tracking the um, stabilization point, uh, displacement speed, and, and local gas velocity normal to the front itself. And what we found is um, a couple of things. One, that the displacement speed isn't as large um, in, in the upward motion. If, if you look at when the flame is moving upstream, the displacement speeds are, are much lower. They're about 10 to 20 meters a second, which is plausibly um, uh, a deflagration wave, or at least close to a deflagration wave, wave where some of the transport processes can kick in and balance reaction. And another point here is that the local gas velocity, if you integrate the, shown here by the dash line, um, is of the same order as the local displacement speed. So it's plausible that the flame can propagate upstream against um, this uh, oncoming turbulent flow. It's a, at a lower velocity and the stoichiometric mixture fraction is in leaner condition. <clears throat> and so we think that this flame is probably propagating upstream and then propagating downstream together with the mo motion of the jet coherent structures. And to further understand its, its um, correlation with the large scale coherent mixing structures, we, we see that the cycle kind of repeats itself every two uh, jet times. And so then what we can do is look at a power spectrum, uh, compare the power spectrum or frequency of the stabilization point fluctuations with the, the axial velocity correlations across the two, um, two anchoring, across the width of the, uh, of the mixing layer, uh, twice uh, delta to one half, and, and to look at that frequency spectra. So H prime, the solid line here, uh, plotted versus the Struhl number, shows um, a peak at about 0.035. And similarly, the um, axial velocity correlation <coughs> uh, also shows a peak at the same Struhl number. And if we look at the Struhl number, that corresponds to two jet times. And so what we've done here is to then show a further linkage between the coherent, the frequency of the shedding of the coherent jet motions and the um, fluctuation of the stabilization point. So, so I think the, the message is that this flame can be anchored by a multiple number of mechanisms, including propagation, and including convective and auto ignition effects, depending on the selection of the parameter that it finds itself in. Uh, another interesting thing that we can get glean out of these data are the um, statistics um, that might be useful for developing models conditioned on being near the stabilization point. So this is statistic here shows the mean stabilization uh, point uh, uh, joint uh, PDF, and and so we. Um, you see that it's mean uh, position, axial position, and transverse position where the flame anchors. We can also condition, um, look at the mixture fraction, conditional on being at the mean stabilization point. And what we see is that it definitely tends to anchor where the mixture fraction is very, very lean, um, close to the um, minimum ignition delay time, so in a, in a homogeneous case. Um, we can also look at the <coughs> Conditional scalar dissipation rate, again, conditional on being at the stabilization point, not anywhere else at stoichiometric or wherever. But in here we find the dissipation rate is very low. It's, it's on the order of uh, about 100 or 200 inverse seconds. So very low dissipation rates, and it looks to be kind of Gaussian in shape, PDF. 
Um, and then finally, we can look at the conditional down color number at the stabilization point, and we find that it's of order 10. So it um, tends to be, in this case, stabilized by um, auto ignition uh, with some probability of, here's 10 to 0, some probability of, of flame propagation, uh, but mo more likely uh, due to auto ignition. Okay, and then <clears throat> another thing we can use, another type of analysis that we can perform with these data is is a chemical explosive mode analysis um, that um, Professor Liu and, and, and La uh, worked out and, and looking at the governing equations for a chemically reacting flow. <coughs> uh, we can look at the, um, uh, just at the chemical Jacobian for the reaction rates and positive eigenvalues of this uh, Jacobian indicate uh, chemical explosive mode. I, I won't go over the specifics of this methodology, because I think uh, Professor Liu did this yesterday evening. So just uh, provide the reference here. Um, and then using um, the composition of, of the chemical mode um, based on the CSP ideas, you can identify the correlation of species with the, most, with the chemical explosive mode through the explosion index. And you can also look at the contribution of um, individual species reactions to this explosive mode through the participation index once you have know what the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are associated with this um, mode. So we applied this to this um, lifted um, hydrogen and also the ethylene air jet plane. <coughs> and uh, what's shown here on the, on the left is the, um, uh, <coughs> chemical, the chemical explosive mode. Um, shown in, in red are the explosive modes and then the um, uh, non-explosive modes are shown, negative values are shown uh, by the bluish colors and the crossover point that distinguishes between the explosive and non-explosive mode is, is um, uh, going from the blue to the reddish colors. And so this method clearly identifies that the um, mixing layers uh, upstream of the lifted uh, anchoring point are highly explosive and therefore auto-ignitive in the absence of any kind of dissipative uh, mechanism. And then it also serves as an indicator in a complex flow of the different flame branches. And so what you see is uh, separating the, the red and blue is, uh, at this fork here is a lean, very faint lean premixed flame branch, a much uh, more pronounced rich premixed flame branch, and then a trailing um, diffusion flame. And then every now and then, you can also see this non-monotonically connected um, hot spots uh, ahead of, uh, of the main flame. If we then um, uh, take the ratio of the chemical explosive mode with the scalar dissipation rate based on the mixture fraction, we can better understand the effect of dissipative losses on, on, on how explosive um, or the chemical um, explosiveness of these regions. And so we see that because we have high scalar dissipation rate in the fuel jet, central fuel jet, that the region where that's denoted red purely by this chemical reaction rate Jacobian is lessened <coughs> when you include um, dissipation losses. But still, you see the, the two mixing layers ahead of the lifted point as being um, largely explosive. And this also still conti continues to be a good marker um, of showing the true liftoff height. And especially in cases where we have very, very dilute, um, very faint, weak flames, as you often do when you dilute uh, flames, that this methodology identifies the lean premix branch much more so than if you use an ad hoc definition of based on temperature or OH radical. And so this is a much more quantitative way of describing the liftoff point. Furthermore, we can look at the weighted explosion index in different regions of this flame and identify what are the critical rate limiting uh, species and reactions. And so this last panel on the right shows some of the key rate limiting reactions that contribute to the explosive mode in the near field being O atom and OH radical, on the rich side being HO2, and then at the point where you have thermal explosion it's temperature. Downstream in the, in the uh, diffusion flame you have CO and acetaldehyde as being some of the important rate limiting um, species that contri contribute to this um, chemical mode. That just illustrates another use of, of this kind of data to, to gain access to the chemical information and how that can help <coughs> help um, 
demarcate different parts of the plane. Another use of the data is for modeling. And so now I'd like to just show one example where we use this data to do a priori uh, analysis of a second order conditional moment closure model. <clears throat> and this is a nice framework for analyzing some of the fluctuations, scalar fluctuations, either to the temperature or species, and what impact they have on, on uh, finite rate kinetic effects like auto ignition or extinction. And so, so far a lot of our modeling is based on first order closure methods uh, based on conditional means. And the question is, arises as to whether you need to consider fluctuating um, variances, um, conditional variances and covariances in order to capture um, uh, mean reaction rates, conditional mean reaction rates correctly. So we can investigate that with this data. <coughs> and, and so another, I'll describe some of the results here in a moment, but CMC, second order CMC is a good framework for basic study of composition fluctuations and it tells you what the origin of these fluctuations is. Um, and it also allows you to examine if there are opportunities for reduction in the variance or covariance matrix um, that you have to solve for or carry when you compute the conditional mean reaction rate. So that's been one big complaint and why people don't do second order uh, CMC is because of the cost of having to compute this expensive covariance matrix, especially if you have a large mechanism with a lot of species. Um, and what I'll show you in a minute is that there is a necessity of including second order closure if you want to capture fluctuating um, or if you, it, for ignition type problems. Um, so just to illustrate, this is the, um, the reaction rate closure um, shown here, the conditional reaction rate, conditional mixture fraction, and the, and the conditional mean um, scalars. To first order is shown by this term, and then um, you do a second order expansion of the Taylor series, you get this higher order, second order term that depends on the covariance made, conditional covariance matrix in this reaction rate Hessian. And so if we plot the thermal, conditional thermal um, uh, rea mean reaction rate, the DNS is, is shown here by the symbols, which is the RANS average, uh, conditional average, and then the first order closure just based on the conditional means, gives you the stash line. So it over predicts by a lot the conditional mean reaction rate for the, uh, for the temperature, for the um, heat release. On the other hand, um, second order conditional closure is the red line, and it, it, you get much better agreement with the DNS data by including the conditional fluctuations of the scalars. What we also found is that <coughs> um, the set, that the second order contribution to this covariance matrix, you don't actually have to carry nine species, but 80% of that is captured with only four conditional covariances, temperature, hydrogen, atom, hydrogen molecule, and OH. And so having that data and being able to look at the corrections to this covariance matrix um, is really useful. We can also look and understand where these conditional fluctuations come from. Uh, by looking at a budget for the conditional variance, for example, for HO2 at an upstream position, just upstream of the lifted flame at four and a half millimeters, right before the liftoff point. <coughs> and so, as you would expect um, uh, from a first order closure, uh, reaction, or reaction is the primary source for generation of these HO2 uh, fluctuations and convection is its uh, uh, main method of destruction of these fluctuations. But if you think about it, initially the, there is no mixture fraction variation in, at the inlet. It's all a constant mixture fraction. And so how do you, how do you actually uh, initiate the generation of the conditional variances? And so what has become important and what's revealed by these DNS is that the turbulent flux is the initial um, generator for these um, fluctuations. And the reason for this given that you have a constant mixture fraction at the inlet, is that the, the velocity, fluid parcels move at different speeds with very high fast speed, short residence times where the flow is very, at the central part of the jet, and slower, um, longer residence times uh, where the fluid is not moving as quickly. And so as a result, if you have a shorter residence time um, at the central part of the jet, you can't, your reactions won't develop as, as far, and those won't generate, self-generate 
scalar gradients or diffuse gradients that are, your diffusion will be less as a result of lower reaction uh, progress uh, in the faster moving fluid. And so you end up gener generating conditional spatial scalar gradients <coughs> um, assisted by this difference in the mean velocity across the jet. And that provides the initial source of generation for these um, scalar fluctuations. And once that's generated, then reaction can kick in and, and create, even amplify those um, scalar fluctuations. And so previously, it was thought that dissipation rate fluctuations due to mixture fraction was the main um, uh, initial generator of these um, variances. But we found that, that that's not true. It's actually due to reaction generated diffusion gradients. Um, and so this illustrates the ability of, uh, or, or ability to understand where the conditional fluctuations come from uh, in these calculations that then have a significant impact on the conditional mean reaction rates that you have to close in your equations. As another illustration, uh, this is a posteriori comparison now of this DNS, same DNS data set, but with, in the context of large eddy simulation. So this is a, um, a model uh, flamelet, uh, unsteady flamelet modeling approach uh, by Ed Knudsen and, and Heinz Pitch and his group. <coughs> and the objective here is to leverage DNS to help validate some of the um, issues, or open issues in LES framework of unsteady flamelets. Uh, and in particular, I won't go into much of the details, but they're in the references. Uh, it's been used to understand this uh, resolved scale scalar dissipation rate, uh, modeling and the, and the need for transported um, models of scalar dissipation rate and subfilter mixture fraction variance as opposed to just algebraic models. So a lot of the error associated with the thermochemical results are due to inaccuracies of the scalar mixing. And so that a, lot, a lot of that is corrected when you include transported, um, <coughs> transported scalar dissipation rate models. Uh, another aspect that was looked into was differential diffusion modeling. We need to account for non-unity Lewis number molecular effects when turbulent diffusivities are so large and high Reynolds number flow. So we can evaluate that assumption in, this, in the context of this flameload approach. And we can also start to investigate LES numerical issues like mesh resolution uh, effects. So if, if we have a coarse-grained LES on a million cells, um, do we get the same level of agreement as we would with the 20 million? cell LES. So the, some of the numerical issues associated with grid resolution and with filtering operations can also be systematically investigated. So <clears throat> just one example from the dif differential diffusion for LES. These are the filtered unsteady flame load equation uh, that Ed and, and Heinz solved, where the um, turbulent diffusivity is shown in this term here, reaction source term. And then all of the molecular diff diffusivity is shown by this messy set of terms in mixture fraction coordinates on the bottom row here, including the Lewis number effect, which is uh, if you just assume constant Lewis number, then all of these terms here vanish. <coughs> and so to actually, there's some arithmetic that goes into deriving this criterion, but they came up with a criterion to evaluate the importance of differential diffusion transport relative to, to total transport, that is the turbulent plus the unity Lewis molecular transport through this ratio, uh, which we, we call theta k, <coughs> which is essentially the ratio of the, um, uh, ratio of the molecular diffusivity uh, um, and then weighted by the individual species Lewis numbers and then summed together with the turbulent diffusivity d sub t here, so looking at that ratio. So we actually evaluated that ratio, theta, um, from the DNS data uh, for a couple of different species. I think what's shown here is molecular hydrogen by the solid line, and um, which has a Lewis number of 0.2, and ethylene, um, which has a Lewis number closer to unity, 1.15 is shown in the dashed line. And you can see that that ratio of the molecular to total diffusivity is of order um, five or so for hydrogen and, and also non-negligible even for ethylene. And so if we compare results against the DNS data um, for, let's see, for a one million cell LES, um, 
the DNS data is shown by this black uh, circular symbol. And from an LES with unity Lewis number is shown by the black line. So it <coughs> over predicts, um, predicts ignition uh, happening um, too, too far upstream if you just assume uh, unity Lewis number for all species. Whereas if you account for the Lewis number, non-unity Lewis number flamelets, then you get much better agreement with the DNS data. This is at several different axial positions downstream where we plotted the conditional temperature with mixture fraction. Okay? So this is one good uh, use of the DNS data is, is to show that even at a moderate Reynolds number, uh, 10,000 jet, um, you, you still have to account for differences in molecular diffusivity of different species. <clears throat> then what's shown here is um, looking at some of the numerical issues of LES. On the left panel, at different axial positions ranging from x over h of 3 on down to x of h of 12, where the liftoff height is about 6, between 6 and 7. Um, this is a coarse-grained LES at a million cells, and the one on the right is at 20 million cells. And again, the symbols denote the DNS, and the line, uh, okay, it's even more complicated, because they ended up doing a wide transverse domain and a narrower transverse domain denoted by the solid black line and the dashed line, and I can't remember which one is which. But there was a difference. If you went to a wider domain, what they saw was flapping of the flame and maybe some coupling with acoustics because we have a compressible DNS code where they're dealing with an incompressible LES code. And so when they narrowed their domain, that flapping went away and, and that modified their mixture fraction and their dissipation rate profile, especially in the downstream part of the jet. <coughs> But what you see is that the coarse, in general, the coarse grain LES over predicts uh, the occurrence of, of, um, uh, of ignition and the liftoff point, whereas you get much better agreement with the fine uh, mesh at 20 million LES cells. And they, they believe that a lot of this um, disagreement is, is, um, is due to the inaccuracy. Still, there's still remaining inaccuracies associated with the scalar dissipation rate and the sub-filter scalar, scalar variance of the mixture fraction. And so when you lessen the burden on the sub-filter model, you get better agreement uh, on the thermochemical side in terms of conditional temperatures and conditional species. So they're still looking into that because it's not the flamelet methodology itself that is faulty, but rather getting the mixing, the reactive scalar mixing correct. Um, is so cr critical to getting the rest of the thermochemistry right. And so this also shows the time average CO mass fraction. Again, comparing the coarse grain and refined LES. Coarse is on the left, refined is on the right, and you see better agreement between the LES and DNS um, on the finer mesh. And so it's having this kind of data with very, they use the exact same initial boundary conditions, chemical mechanism as the DNS, and they isolated things one at a time, you can, you can really start to uncover what, what works, what doesn't work, and where the errors are. So I think more and more, as we could push to more realistic Reynolds numbers, more realistic chemistry, that DNS will play a very complementary role to experimental validation in helping validate LES and RANS models. All right, so let's now move to jets and cross flow. <clears throat> so this is the counterpart of flow, And this is work done uh, in connection with um, collaborators at Sintef at, in Norway. Uh, they have a carbon capture European uh, storage European project with some of the, uh, with some of the um, industry over there, Siemens and Alstom and, and GE. <clears throat> and, and with my postdoc, Kinas Kola, Ray Grau, and Ray Grau, now the NRL. So jets and cross-flow are relevant in uh, industrial flares, scrap jets, and in stationary gas turbines. And here we uh, focus primarily on fuel injection in the pre-mixture section of a, of a gas, stationary gas turbine um, burning hydrogen-enriched fuels of the order of 200 to 400 megawatt power rate. <coughs> and the design requirements here are, are that we want enhanced fuel air mixing but we want, at the same time, we want to have an intrinsic flashback safety. So we don't want the flame to anchor anywhere in the premixture section. Um, this configuration, I just want to point out, is rich in terms of complex fluid mechanics. You 
have the, uh, as identified much earlier by Frick and Roshko, you have all sorts of coherent structures in this jet and cross flow, including the jet shear layer of vortice, uh, where you have an oncoming cross stream of heated air against an orthogonal fuel jet coming from issuing from the bottom. And you also end up forming a, kind of a virtual bluff body, if you will, from the flue that then you form a counter-rotating vortex pair that helps entrain and, and rapidly mix the, the fuel and oxidizer. And then between the boundary layer, at the boundary layer, you have these horseshoe vortices or necklace-like uh, vertical structures. And then between the boundary layer and the jet structure, you also have wake vortices that uh, these vertical-like structures. And so all of this is mixing and training, and, and, and somewhere in there you have reaction going on. And so we wanted to probe what the structure of this flame is and, and how that flame is anchored um, aerodynamically above the, uh, above the injection point, fuel injection point. So these were calculations that we performed again at, uh, on Jaguar at Oak Ridge on about 100,000 cores and also at NERSC at, on their hopper uh, machine, right? <clears throat> so here are some of the parameters of the calculation. Again, we're looking at a DNS calculation that's on the order of, of the size of a toku cube. So I like to say it's a couple centimeters and kind of flat in the standwise direction. <clears throat> and we're looking at 2.7 billion grids uh, with about 1,400 in the standwise direction, about 1,000 each in both the transverse and standwise direction. Our grid densities are about 17 to 18 microns in the spanwise and streamwise direction, and then they're uh, more refined in the transverse wall direction because they have to resolve boundary layer structures, where our first grid point is at Y plus of a half, and we have uh, 13 or so grid points across the viscous boundary layer. Um, the air is coming in uh, from left to right in this configuration at preheated to 750 Kelvin, coming in at a speed of about 55 meters a second. And then we've looked at hydrogen air and various compositions of CO and hydrogen nitrogen um, issuing from the bottom. And we've also looked at angles of injection ranging from 90 degrees to blow off at about 70, 75 degrees relative to horizontal. Um, the jet velocity of the fuel plume is about 250 meters a second. It's about a millimeter nozzle diameter. Uh, the Reynolds number of the jet is about 4,000 um, mass uh, Flux is four and a half. Momentum flux is 3.4. Um, and then we use a detailed mechanism for hydrogen air by Lee et al. And then we run an auxiliary inert DNS, turbulent boundary layer DNS, uh, periodic turbulent boundary layer, and then we temporally sample at a given streamwise location from the inert auxiliary turbulent boundary layer flow and feed that into this reactive um, DNS. And then the solution is advanced with a constant time step on the order of four nanoseconds. Okay, some of the parameters that we varied with this configuration include the nozzle geometry. We've looked at square uh, geometries, round geometries, and elliptic jets. We're, we're also varying the injection angle, uh, 90 degrees and 75 degrees, interested in the dynamics of flow off. And then, as I said, looking at the variations of the fuel composition between CO and hydrogen ratios. This slide here shows an example of the jet cross flow instantaneous slice in the spanwise midplane, showing the mixture fraction in the upper left quadrant isocontours. So fuel is denoted by red, uh, whereas the oxidizer is blue. And then overlaid on top of those are the heat release, instantaneous heat release isocontours between 5 and 95% of the max. And so one thing that's very clear from the heat release contours is, is that it's not a nice corrugated flame. It's shredded, especially in the region where the jet bends over. And you have the production of a lot more fine scale, intense turbulent mixing structures. <clears throat> OK, and so then on the, for the next picture here, uh, what I've, what's shown here is just a very closely uh, spaced time sequence. On the, on the center midplane uh, of those uh, quantities, the mixture fraction and the heat release. And the reason I show this is because you can see the, um, the flame instantaneously seems to anchor on the shear layer vortex structures. And if you track these in time, it's kind of uh, sucked in, or these tendrils of the heat release are pulled in by the, the shear layer vortex structures. 
And then, so kind of, you can see that going from top to right, and then bottom to the right. So they're basically wrapped up and trained by these shear layer uh, vortices on the leeward side. Now we can then take a far mean picture of this plane stabilization. <clears throat> and so shown here on the top left is the velocity magnitude uh, isocontours. And again, I'm showing that now these are the Faber mean heat release contours. So you see there's kind of two branches. There's one that sits on the uh, windward side on the upper part of this jet. And then you see another branch of strong heat release anchored right about here on the windward side. Okay, and then the interesting thing, if you look at the heat release contour, it's the peak heat release and leading edge is sitting here where the velocity magnitude is pretty low. It's about 20 meters a second, uh, about one-fifth of the, of the, uh, the red uh, high velocity regions. Similarly, if we look at the mixture fraction isocontours here, you see that the flame is anchored near the stoichiometric mixture fraction of about 0.17, I think. <coughs> We then plot the temperature, the, 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 the uh, Faber mean of temperature and of OH mass fraction in the bottom left and right corners here. And overlaid on top of that are the low velocity regions shown by the black isocontour lines. And you can see that from both the temperature and OH fields that the flame tends to anchor where the velocity is low. So one conclusion we have is the anchoring occurs primarily on the leeward side, it's very steady, and it wants to sit where, the, where there's a low velocity bubble induced by the cross flow that's wrapping around the, <coughs> the jet flue, um, resulting in an opposed flow at the symmetry plane on the jet lead side. So this is first found uh, at, or seen in, in our DNS. More recently, and probably what you'll see at the, at the symposium, for those of, the, of you that are going to Warsaw, is some experimental work studied by Steinberg and, and Wolfgang Meyer and others at DLR <coughs> of um, reactive hydrogen jets and cross flow. And, and they performed their experiments under very similar conditions to our DNS, with the exception of one thing, which I'll talk about in a minute. But what they see from their um, temperature field measurements using Raman scattering uh, here is the um, Again, the, the, our jet velocity of the, it was 200 meters, 250 meters a second. Theirs here, 200 meters a second. Um, <coughs> and the, this is the, um, let's see, what are they plotting here? Okay, this is the the uh, mixture temperature field and the, and the uh, mix, mean mixture fraction uh, isocontours. And so they actually see two. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, and, th and then they plotted this black dashed line, which is the mean jet trajectory. And what they see is actually two anchoring points. <coughs> One on the windward side, which they see moves around a lot in the streamlines extent. And then they also observe an anchoring point from their mean picture on the leeward side. They also did simultaneous PID measurements of the mean axial velocity field in the vicinity of, of where this anchoring point is. And they see from this colored isocontra plot low, velo low velocity regions shown in blue. <coughs> and then the black line here, I think, is their, um, their either their temperature or, or OH um, isocontra lines. But they see that the flame anchors on the leeward side primarily in this low velocity region, which is consistent with what we found from our DNS. The, the inconsistency that we still have to resolve is that they see kind of a secondary, what they're calling it a secondary anchoring point on the windward side, and they're attributing that to edge flame propagation. But the question I have in my mind is that it, it seems kind of unlikely that it's edge flame propagation because it has to propagate against a cross stream velocity of about 55 meters a second. So that has to be a pretty high burning velocity in order to be able to withstand that high high oncoming velocity. <clears throat> and so what um, I'll, I'll say a bit more about that. And, and I think one reason why we don't observe it in our DNS calculation is that the boundary layer 
that we feed in and are, as part of our turbulence feed has a, has a thicker boundary layer than what they have uh, in, in their experiments. So they have a two millimeter boundary layer, whereas our boundary layer thickness is, is 10 or 11 millimeters. And so that will change the flow characteristics and the flow flame interaction on the windward side. So we're repeating our calculations now by generating a turbulent speed with a much thinner boundary layer. And then we'll redo that cal comparison. <clears throat> but the other point I want to make is that the only way that I see that that secondary anchoring point on the windward side can occur is if there are some active intermediate radicals ahead of the edge flame. And so we went looking for that in our DNS calculations for things like HO2, um, H2, and other, uh, and the temperature field. And what we found is that there is a envelope of HO2, which is a, uh, that's generated ahead of any significant heat release and that the temperature there is in the range between 780 to 1,000 Kelvin. And so it's very, it, it may be that because we have shredded heat release zones, and so there's, there's interaction between the hot product gases of the flame and the preheat zones, that there could be recirculation of, of some of the, um, at least heat, if not other intermediate species, back up ahead of the flame that provide kind of an auto-ignited environment like we saw in the co-flowing jet flames for which the, they can experimentally observe an edge flame propagating upstream against that fast moving cross stream. So that remains to be seen um, from this next set of DNS that we're going to perform. <clears throat> so when we analyze this DNS data in detail, our cartoon of, of the, the structure that we see in this flame is shown here. We see flame tendrils anchor in the shear layer vortices that I showed you earlier. This is followed, uh, and then we further find that the Leading into that flame is partially premixed, and that we found by looking at the Takano mixing index, which shows the alignment of the fuel gradients and the oxidizer gradients conditioned on the local heat release. And so we found that it's not a non premixed flame at the anchoring point, but it's premixed in nature. <coughs> and then subsequently, we see a diffusion flame region downstream of the partially premixed flame. We see an, an oxidizer depleted jet core region. And on the bottom half, we also see a, a, a diffusion flame region. And then on the bottom leeward side, we see a low velocity region, and that's where the highest heat release is found. OK, now <clears throat> the next thing we did with this data was to dynamically change the injection angle from 90 degrees orthogonal to the cross stream direction to, the, to a low enough angle where we saw the flame actually dynamically blow off. <clears throat> and that was around 75 degrees. And, oops, well, I'll cut to the chase. The, the chase is that when we moved it to 75 degrees, the low velocity bubble that we saw when we originated at 90 degrees vanished. And so this flame didn't have the, air, the external aerodynamic low velocity region to anchor on. <clears throat> Uh, and, and so, you know, the question is then, can you just run an inert case and where you change the injection angle where you see the um, disappearance or the elongation of the low velocity region, then you, you can expect that the flame anchoring mechanism is, is greatly diminished or not. So we analyzed it a little bit more closely, and we, what we found is that blow, blow off is really due to a kinematic imbalance between the flame propagation speed and the flow normal velocity. So in the first phase, what we see is that the dominant flow structures, which are these shear layer vortices, repeatedly draw the flame base closer to the jet center line in a higher scalar dissipation region, uh, higher vorticity magnitude, magnitude, and the flame finds itself in a fuel-rich region, richer than the stoichiometric mixture fractions. And so that weakens the flame. In the second phase, as the flame starts to move down, flame leading edge starts to propagate downstream around that bend, <clears throat> then in spite of the fact that the dissipation rate and velocities decrease as you move away downstream in, along the jet trajectory, what happens is that uh, the flame alignment um, normal to the cross flow direction, so that nor flame aligns normal to the cross flow direction. And so the, flo the flow velocity normal to the flame base increases to 
the point where it's seeing fully the 55 meters per second cross stream velocity, and it can't anchor, and so it blows off. And so it's a combination of the weakening of the flame by the eddies, shear layer vortices drawing the flame into the faster moving, cool rich mixture that starts to weaken the flame. And as it starts to, flame base starts to migrate downstream along the jet trajectory, it, its orientation changes so that it, it, sees, no, uh, it sees the oncoming cross stream velocity, which just affects uh, that weakened flame completely out of the domain. So we think that's what's causing the blow off. Now, the third topic, if you can stay with me. <laughs> uh, okay, are there, yeah. Have you tried any leak into the cross flow? We haven't done that, We're, uh, although that sounds like an interesting configuration. We are also looking at angling in the spanwise direction. And so um, that's, an, that's an interesting configuration, especially since injectors are not in isolation. There's usually several fuel injection holes. And so you're interacting. Um, jets in the spanwise direction. So we're looking at angling the jet in the azimuthal direction. Uh, but you're right, also making it greater than 90 degrees into the um, upstream direction would be interesting too. Well, it's pre-mixed. Um, I mean, it's, it's mixed, but it's because of the aerodynamics, it's, um, it's, it's blowing off. So you don't want it to anchor uh, close. In, in this situation, you don't want it to anchor close to the fuel injection. It's the, the leading edge is fully premixed. So we already looked at that in terms of the um, mixing index based on the alignment of the, the fuel and oxidizer gradients at the leading edge where we see the high heat release. And that's already premixed. So the, the counter-rotating vortex pair and the shear layer vortices and the jet breakdown are very efficient at, at entraining and, and mixing, the, mixing the reactants quickly. <coughs> oh, OK. So we actually put it, I didn't talk about that. but So, so um, we put in a hot rod, thermal, thermally, a thermal rod of 0.25 millimeter <laughs> diameter on the leeward side of the of the inert jet, and we let it auto basically ignite. This would be like spark igniting, right? And then we let it sit for, I don't know, 10 microseconds, and then we take it away. And then we let the, um, uh, then we run it for one flow through time to flush out all of the transient, initial transits before we upsample and start taking data. Okay. Can you speak up, please? We haven't tried that. Um, that yeah. Uh, we haven't tried that. I think there have been some experiments by Noel Clements in this configuration where he's looked at pulsed jets and cross flow. But I, I, we, haven't, we haven't tried that. Say that again. We haven't tried that. We, we these momentum ratios, flux ratios, are and or, and temperatures and so on are, are directly from Syntef and I think probably directly from their industrial partners. You know, they're more representative of actual burners that people are trying to design. But I think that is an interesting thing. And actually. What we see in, I don't have a movie today, but the low temperature regions and where there's a presence of a ton of HO2 are in these wake structures between the wall and the, and the jet. And so that I can imagine that those, that transport of HO2 and, and heat between the wall and the jet could be a really interesting area to investigate. Uh, and also a, potentially a danger for, for flashback. <laughs> Structures and those streamlined structures should play an important role 
Are you talking about the counter-rotating vortex pair, the streamwise yes. board seeds? Yes, between <coughs> spawn-wise board seeds, there should be a streamwise board seed between the two <coughs> spawn-wise board seeds. Yes. And those streamwise board seeds play an important role for the breakdown of the spawn-wise board seeds. Right. So those streamwise board seeds, I think, should play some important role for the flame stabilization mechanism. Yeah, we haven't explored the flame structure and um, propagation, especially on the windward side, in enough detail yet. Our suspicion, because we see evidence of HO2 ahead of the flame near the bend, is that, and we see broken reaction zones, is that the CBP, those streamwise vortices, act to pr provide kind of another big recirculation region, right? To, to get, provide residence time and be able to transport some of the product, hot product gases, heat, and, and maybe, maybe HO2 or other speed H2 back upstream. And, and furthermore, the jet, once the, the jet structures break down, we see a lot of evidence of, um, of small scale intense vort vortical structures that penetrate the preheat layers. So there could be some kind of distributed reaction zone or, or broken reaction zone kind of flame structure and propagation into a reactive mixture. But I haven't, we haven't, we're still in the process of analyzing the data. And so I, I believe, I think you're right, they're absolutely right. There's probably a big role of the mixing. And, and maybe that, this is a question as to whether that mixing of um, reactive species could be what's helping anchor on the, on the um, windward side that is observed from the experiment. And they see it fluctuate a lot axially, and, and maybe because it's a highly unstable situation as opposed to having that low velocity bubble that's always there on the other side. So <clears throat> that, that's, a, that's a really good question, because it's most of the previous definitions have been based on the the streamlines, right, or the um, momentum equation. Here, we, we came up with a new definition based on, um, on the mixing field for mixture fraction. So we, we take an isocontour of mixture fraction that envelopes pr practically everything, 0.05, and then um, we solve a, a Laplace equation on that to identify it, the isosurface of the periphery of the jet. And then we also um, integrate volumetrically inwards from that also solving the Laplace equation. And so we end up with a reactive jet um, trajectory based on the mixture fraction um, that varies monotonically between zero at the inlet of the, the plume uh, uh, nozzle to unity at the exit. And then we can bin that up between 0 and 1 into number of bins and, and take our conditional statistics along that jet trajectory. So, so you actually take a few steps and you go inward towards the jet normally to the edge? Yeah. We go from the edge and integrate inwards. Because the, the, the jet flame is so convoluted, and if you just took a normal, you might not hit it. I mean, you might, right? It's not a nice, um, nice iso smooth isosurface very convoluted, so it's very tricky to, to find just a normal vector from the, the mean jet trajectory and still be normal to the um, isosurfaces of the mixture fraction. I have, it's in a, a JFM paper that's about to come out. I can probably uh, give you the, the reference for that. Okay. Using a couple of things. One, 
the simplest thing to do is to take Takano's mixing index, which looks at the orientation of the fuel gradient vector and the oxidizer vector, and look at the alignment, right? And so if they're at, at 180 degrees apart, it's a uh, non-premixed, and if they're aligned, or reasonably aligned, it's a premixed system. Um, but that only tells you about the mixedness. It doesn't tell you anything about reaction. So you have to take that index and condition it on the local heat release or, or local progress variable or some other thing like that. So that tells us whether it's premixed or non-premixed burning locally. <coughs> okay, so oh, one last one. Sorry, say it again. How do you introduce uh, random fluctuations in turbulence release? Does it matter where you introduce these fluctuations and do the results depend on the kind of fluctuations you introduce? Um, so yes, I think that's a that's a very good question. So what, what we try to do is to not just um, specify a energy spectrum, right? Like a passe, passo Pouquet spectrum, and then superimpose that on a mean flow, right, with the fluctuations, and then let that interact with the flame because you're, you're imposing an artificial spectrum. So it's not, it takes some time and distance for that to evolve to a, to a real spectrum. So what we do is actually run an auxiliary separate um, DNS of an inert, non-reacting um, turbulence, either isotropic decaying, or in this case it was a turbulent boundary layer, right, or channel flow, and let it evolve until it's statistically stationary. And then we sample that temporally in the reactive simulation. Or you can feed it in using Taylor's hypothesis, expected in using Taylor's hypothesis. But you want the flame to meet fully developed turbulence. And I'll show you in, in this third example, which is a temporally evolving slot jet flame, also some tricks about how you put your flame outside of, of the mean shear zone so that you give your simulation adequate time for the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability to form and, and completely develop fully developed shear driven turbulence before the flame interacts with the turbulence. Okay. All right. Should we talk about the last topic then here? Or, well, the last example. <laughs> okay. So this is a work done with uh, him and Cola, with Kevin Hawks uh, at University of New South Wales, Alan Kirstein at Sandia, and, and myself. And, and this is looking at um, now switching gears to turbulent premixed combustion. This is lean hydrogen air combustion. And we were interested in, in um, turbulent burning velocities and especially looking at the uh, flame area generation and wrinkled, uh, wrinkling at, at the in LES and RANS context. So looking at subfilter flame wrinkling. But we also found that the data um, is, is useful in, in terms of looking at the spectral characteristics of various scalars and scalar velocity quantities. <clears throat> so part of the motivation comes from um, trying to find reduced dimensionality to represent thermochemical states. And typically, um, we find a lot of the models, flamelet models, CMC, and, and progress variable approaches rely on, on, on reduced dimensions in terms of the mixture fraction, which is a conserved scalar in the progress variable, which is a reactive scalar, so you also have to close the source term. Um, and, and we also know that <coughs> in LES and RANS, uh, you have, you have uh, require unresolved um, uh, mean and higher, higher order moments have to, have to be closed, the variances and covariances. Most closures, however, are based on, in our models, uh, are still based on scaling laws for passive scalars for homogeneous isotropic incompressible turbulence. So people still assume universality and isotropy at the small scales. And a lot of the theory and scaling laws are developed for isotropic incompressible flows. So we need to start to question or verify that this justification is valid in a reactive system um, and look for spectral consistency. So if we look at <coughs> the difference between non premix flames and versus premix flames, and in terms of dilatational gas expansion effects, we find first for, for non premix flames that are diffusion controlled, 
they tend to be very responsive to, to the um, turbulent fluid dynamics and are, are you know, mixing limited. Um, and in that situation, dilatation is pretty weak compared to turbulent uh, mechanical strain. And so the, the divergence of the velocity is proportional to the um, inverse uh, density, uh, the gradient of the mixture fraction of the, of the um, specific density. And that tends to be a, a, weak, um, a weak quantity. On the other hand, in premix planes, uh, where you have a self-propagating wave with a local molecular diffusion reactive balance, these planes tend to be more resistive to turbulent fluid dynamics and straining. And dilatation tends to be strong compared to turbulent strain, uh, where the divergence of the velocity here it is, is now proportional to the um, uh, ratio of the turbulent uh, time scale to the flame time scale given by the ratio of the laminar flame speed and the thermal thickness. And so, <coughs> so there's a big difference between uh, gas expansion effects in non-premix flames versus premix flames. And so this has implications um, even for the velocity spectra and perhaps for um, spectral energy transfer from the small scales back to the big scale. So there's just a little bit of review from the past. Uh, Batchelor, uh, a long time ago, came up with passive scalar uh, scaling laws. <coughs> uh, and he identified uh, when the diffusion, uh, uh, scalar diffusion is much uh, lower than um, the uh, kinematic viscosity. You end up in a, a viscous convective range uh, where the energy spectra scales as, uh, to the minus one power law with wave number. On the other hand, if the inverse is true, where you have very diffusive species compared with the kinematic viscosity, like you would with hydrogen, for example, you might be in an inertial diffusive range with scaling that now, for the scalar energy spectra, that scales with k to the minus 17 over 3. And Corson subsequently studied dilute scalars with first order reactions. And so th these are just simply plots showing the two limiting cases of, of um, k to the minus uh, 5 thirds and then k to the minus 1 behavior when the scalar diffusivity is lower than the viscous diffusivity for um, that, uh, viscosity. <coughs> and the inverse problem here when it scales is to, the, uh, mi to the minus 17 over 3 when um, the scalar is much more diffusive than, than the kinematic viscosity. Subsequently, Bilger and, and Kashai uh, considered a, a bivariate reacting systems uh, where two reactants A plus B go to product with no heat release. This was in an incompressible shear layer. And they looked at the um, spectral coherence of this non premix system in, in two limits, in the frozen limit and in the fast, um, fast reacting equilibrium limit. And what they found is that um, the spectral coherence <coughs> uh, is, remains constant and at unity when it's just uh, mixing limited, and um, and that when it's in the equilibrium limit, um, you get strong coherency at the low wave numbers, but then it vanishes at high wave numbers. So you have scalar return to scalar isotropy uh, in under high frequency ranges. And then Bilger performed some experiments and found that it was some kind of mix between the two, frozen and the equilibrium limit. <coughs> and uh, this is the coherence between the mixture fraction and the velocity um, that, that we're talking about here. And so here the background velocity is isotropic. Again, it's incompressible turbulence. Uh, and you get scalar isotropy at the high wave number range. More recently, people have looked at mixture fraction spectra in jet planes. Um, there was work uh, done by um, Wang and, and Barlow company uh, where they measured the dissipation spectra and length scales, comparing them to the um, turbulent scales, Komogoro scales. And then from DNS data, Vishnavi and also more recently Nas and Pantano have um, looked at shear, shear layer, uh, turbulent shear layers and found that the mixture fraction and velocity spectra, when it's scaled by uh, the density, also obey, obey Komogoro scaling laws. And so to summarize, for these non-premix systems, um, the velocity and the conserved scalar spectra in these jet planes 
uh, look to be similar to those of passive scalar turbulent flows. <clears throat> but we're not sure that these results above can be extended to reactive scalars. And in particular, uh, there are no pr uh, conserved scalars in premixed planes. Even the progress variable is not a conserved scalar. And there's strong dilatational effects, which are more challenging. And when we did a search of the literature, there's not a lot of theory or data for premix planes um, and, and looking at their spectra in the literature. So this kind of motivated this, this configuration, DNS configuration, which is a premixed uh, temporal hydrogen air slot jet plane. Uh, hydrogen air, we actually ran two cases, two equivalence ratios, one which was neutrally stable, uh, equivalence ratio of 0.7, and then we ran one that was thermodiffusively unstable, leader condition at equivalence ratio of 0.4, for which we also carried the NOx chemistry. <clears throat> and this was done at a Reynolds number of 10,000 um, based on the velocities of the two streams, counterflowing streams, and the preheat temperature of the reactants was 700 Kelvin. In this temporal uh, configuration, we have reactant slab in the middle, and on either side of that, we have product slab, adiabatic product slab. And the reactants are then moving to the right, uh, and products are, are moving to the left, since it's a, evolving in time rather than space. And then what we did was we fixed the Reynolds number and varied the down color number in this study by changing the ratios of the jet height, um, which ranged from 2.7 millimeters to about 4 millimeters, 5 millimeters. <coughs> and the, uh, the, the, the uh, shear velocity difference, uh, which was pretty high, it ranged from 300 uh, meters a second down to about 156 meters a second. So this gave us a, a ratio of down color numbers to investigate of about four. Um, here are some of the numerical parameters. The size of the domain um, was about 16 jet heights um, in, the, in the streamwise direction, 20 jet heights in the transverse mean shear direction. And we did a little bit of grid stretching to move the boundaries, physical boundaries, out even further, but where the flame doesn't uh, migrate into that coarser mesh. And then in the spanwise direction, it was 12H, again, narrower, narrower span. And this one cost a lot in terms of grid density because we wanted to push the Reynolds number up as high as we could. And so it was a 7 billion, it's our largest calculation to date, it's 7 billion grid points <coughs> um, where we resolve all of the um, Kolmogorov and plane scales. To give you an idea, the, the, grid, den the grid size spacing is um, 18 microns um, in, the, in the streamwise direction and um, as, as low as 18 microns. And the, the time steps, again, here on the order of nanoseconds, two and a half to five nanosecond time steps that we can take with our explicit solver. <coughs> OK, and these calculations were performed also on Jaguar on 120,000 processors, I think, last year sometime. So the interesting characteristics of this data set is that there are, are a wider range of dynamic scales. We measured that our turbulent Reynolds number here is up to 1,000, um, and that all of the relevant scales are sufficiently resolved. We, uh, Evan took painstaking detail, uh, care in making sure that our minimum resolution for the Kolmogorov scale was of the order of close to a half, half a grid point. And that was in a region um, in the early developing shear layer before, before the flame ever met, the, met, met that turbulence. And this is shown here in this isocontour map showing time on the ordinate, a ordinate axis uh, versus transverse distance. And then this white line here is the mean progress variable of 0.01, showing the very upstream part of the preheat layer. And you can see the yellow, the color contours represent the grid density relative to the Kolmogor mean Kolmogorov scale. And so where we have our under a half here, about 0.4 is our minimum grid density. It's uh, at early times and um, not in a region where the flame has started to interact with it. And everywhere where the flame crosses here, we're at um, grid densities that are adequately resolved. Shown on the bottom right here is the Borgi, modified Borghi diagram showing the turbulence intensity, uh, the ratio of the turbulence intensity to the laminar flame speed on the ordinate and the integral length scale to the flame thickness on the abscissa. 
<coughs> and then these, cross, these diagonal lines here correspond to the turbulent Reynolds numbers between 100 and 1,000. And this is the Karlovitz number line of unity here and down color number line of unity here. And so these trajectories here are, are two, uh, two of our cases, uh, dumb color number uh, minus case and dumb color number, higher dumb color number case here. They're both well into the thin reaction zones regime, if not the broken reaction zones regime, where the Karlovitz numbers are about 20 to 40. <coughs> and what, what we did when we initialized the, um, let me go back. When we initialize the, the um, we initialize this with two laminar premixed, unstrained premixed planes that were situated outside of the mean shear zone. And then we tripped the mean shear with a very low percentage of isotropic turbulence, 4%, and let it develop on its own kelvin Helmholtz instability until it became fully turbulent. And at the point where it becomes fully turbulent, the flame starts to meet this turbulence. So we don't put the, so our thermal uh, scalar mixing layer is wider than our momentum mixing layer initially so that we don't have the interaction between the flame and the flow until we have fully developed tur uh, intense shear driven turbulence, not something artificially uh, imposed at the initial condition. Okay, so <clears throat> here are some of the results. First we compute the, uh, computed the 1D spectra from the streamwise correlation function. In this configuration, um, the homogeneous directions are in the spanwise and streamwise directions. Um, and there were non-homogeneous in the transverse mean shear direction, nor are we in time. And so it's not a stationary configuration. So we take data at a specific Y location. And here, we where I'll show you results at the mean progress variable corresponding to the maximum heat release. And we are, are used as samples. And, and then we compute the auto and cross correlation functions. And then we take the Fourier transform of those to get the auto and co spectra um, uh, uh, defined in these expressions here. And then uh, Heyman computed the spectra in MATLAB using the intrinsic DFT function. So, first thing to look at is the velocity spectra for the two dumb color number cases, shown on the left and right. <coughs> And what we're showing are the three velocity components, UVW, in the colors red, blue, and green. And I'm also overlaying on here the k to the minus 5 thirds inertial range scaling. And what we see from the data is that there's about a, a little over a decade in inertial range um, exhibited in this data for both uh, dumb color numbers that we looked at. We then looked at the scalar spectra um, normalized by the spe uh, species auto spectra. And what I'm showing here on the left um, for DA minus and DA plus on the right, again, we're showing the O2 uh, scalar spectra and the fuel uh, H2 spectra. And then these very faint green lines here, 2 pi over delta L and 2 pi over 10, delta L over 10, indicate the flame thickness based on the thermal thickness and one tenth of that. So you're into the reactive layers, zones of the spectra in this region here. And so again, the scalar spectra exhibit about a decade of inertial range scaling <coughs> uh, in both cases, and then they fall, and then it rolls off. But one interesting thing we see is that the hydrogen spectrum falls off rapidly uh, in the inertial diffusive range, but there looks to be a little bit of a blip or bump at the high wave number that's prominent for hydrogen, but not for oxygen. And if you look closely in the velocity spectra, it's less prominent, but there's also a blip in the velocity spectra uh, at about the same wavelength where some of these reactive stuff uh, appear. The next thing we did was to look at co-spectra and coherence from the DA minus, dumb color nine minus case. And we looked at both major species um, uh, coherence with other major species, as well as major species coherence with intermediate radicals like the H atom. <coughs> so the coherence spectra for O2H2 is shown in, in the blue line here, um, and the co spectra is shown in red. And so again, from the co spectra, you see kind of this inertial range scaling, 
you see this again, strange blip at, very, at the very highest wave numbers. And the, co the, the, co the coherence spectra between the fuel and oxidizer is very high at low wave numbers, as you would expect, because of the large scale imposition of the velocity um, coherent jet structures. But you would expect that that coherence would die off as you go to high wave numbers, as we saw from Bilger and Kushai's earlier work that, that basically that coherence spectra falls off to zero, so you have isotropy at the high wave numbers. But we don't see that here. We see it fall off rapidly, but then at the very highest wave numbers, we see it go back up. And so they're correlated uh, at the very highest wave numbers. Similarly, but to a lesser degree, we see um, coherence, uh, coherency between the uh, oxidizer and H atom. Again, high at low wave numbers decreases and then it goes back up at the very end. They might then ask, ask well, is there also <coughs> coherence uh, what the um, uh, species velocity cospectra and coherence look like? So the red curve shows the oxidizer velocity um, cospectra um, and then the blue curve here shows the coherency between the oxidizer and velocity. And similarly, you have coherence at low wave numbers, falls off, and then there's a sharp increase at the point where there's uh, within a thermal flame thick, less than a flame, flame thickness. And even looking at velocity velocity um, uh, coherence, you, you see for the UW component, there, it, there seems to be a rise at the highest wave numbers. So this hasn't been observed before. And we're still in the middle of investigating this and, and what the ramifications are for, for spectral energy transfer and, and modeling. But what, the, what we do observe so far is that the inertial range behavior for velocity and scalars um, seems to be consistent with classical laws. We see a high spectral coherence at large wave numbers for reacting scalars. And this is, seems to be contrary to what people have seen for non free mixed combustion. <coughs> And that it extends, um, this coherence also extends to velocity scalars and velocity velocity too. So this could have implications for <coughs> Reynolds stresses, for closures for the Reynolds stresses and, and for the turbulent scalar fluxes. Um, and the coherence happens to occur in the wave number range corresponding to where these active chemical scales are occurring. So that's as far as we've gotten with this work. Now, how are we doing for time? Are you guys want to take another five minute break before we talk about data mining? Or you want to keep going? Break? All right. Or do you have, wait, before you break, does anyone have any questions on this part of the work? Okay. How about five minutes? Let's talk about data mining of, of large simulated combustion turbulence data and how to uh, glean insight out of that. <coughs> I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about feature-based statistical analysis of extreme scale um, combustion science data. And this is work largely done with my computer science colleague, Janine Bennett, um, uh, Hong Feng Yu, at, who are uh, at Sandia National Labs, and other folks at uh, largely emanating from the University of Utah with Valerio Pascucci, at Lawrence Livermore Labs, Peter Timo Bremer, uh, Greg Rao, who was a uh, postdoc of mine now at Inrel, Ajit Mascaranhaus, who is a postdoc of me now at Google, <coughs> and um, uh, Kwan Lu Ma at, at UC Davis. So <coughs> here's an outline of, of this part of the talk. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, some of our feature-based statistical analysis and some examples of that. From, uh, additional analysis using global shape characteristics having to do with the question of how do we find define jet plane tra uh, trajectories and cross flow. Um, another case study which looks at analysis of a bunch of small intermediate features like ignition, small ignition kernels or small extinction holes um, that are fast moving and intermittent. How do you actually analyze those? <coughs> and case three has to do with how to actually track some of these identified flow or, or combustion features, both spatially and temporally. And then, um, 
I'd like to touch upon a little bit what we plan to do as we move towards exascale and the machine characteristics or the projected characteristics will change a lot and what this implies for our analysis and visualization. And then I'd like to leave you with a whole list of references if you want to read up more about them. Excuse me. So, uh, as I pointed out earlier, there's been a large uh, number of large DNS databases that have been generated in the last decade. And these um, are now approaching about a petabyte. I think our largest data set is about three quarters of a petabyte of data for the um, premix hydrogen air turbine planes. And so, we, like most of us here, we, we like to think of post, we like to separate uh, solving our uh, computing our uh, solution and saving a bunch of restart files and then post-processing offline at our leisure and more iteratively as, as we have uh, research questions that we want to answer. But as we move towards the future, I think that paradigm has to, has to change for a number of reasons. <clears throat> so gleaning scientific data from, from massive data sets is complicated by a number of factors. First of all, just the sheer size of the data. If you're talking about 7 billion grid points with 100 um, dependent variables per grid point, that's a lot of data to have to analyze and try to sift through. And then furthermore, we typically have hundreds of time steps that we write to disk for, for several flow-through times of the phenomenon you're looking at. <coughs> the data is also very complex. It's multivariate. Right? As I said, there's not maybe, you know, we have lots of species that we're transporting. Turbulence is a complicated phenomenon. It's not often um, determined solely by the first two moments, the mean invariance, but higher moments, skewness, ketosis also matter. A lot of the intermittency happens in the tails of our histograms <coughs> that can have profound effects on extinction, ignition, and so on. So really understanding intermittency and how that couples with claims or ignition is really important. Uh, Lane scale, again, is broad. Everything from microns on up to centimeters, and if we can afford meter, uh, you know, even larger scales, that'd be great. That'd be great. Temporal scales are similarly very broad, nanoseconds to milliseconds. So, <clears throat> so what we're looking to is any way that we can reduce the amount of information that we have to filter through to, to understand what's in the data, embedded in the data. So feature-based conditional statistics um, provide one way of getting concise summaries of the data. And so we want to, and then furthermore, since we have all this rich um, space, spatially and temporally resolved data, we can characterize, you know, we have more than just point statistics at our fingertips. A lot of the analysis in the past has been based on from measurements. <coughs> Think about Brahma and Rayleigh scattering, right? These are point or multi-point type statistics. And so a lot of the analysis follows suit. Whereas here, when you have access to spatially temporally resolved flow plane structure, and structure is inherently multi-point, right? It's, it's, you have non-local effects. You can, for example, have passage of a streaky boundary layer structure, and then sometime later in space and distance, something happens to a plane. So it doesn't have to be local. It's non-local effects that we want to capture above and beyond um, traditional multi-point statistics. <coughs> and so we, we're looking for methodology that will allow us to do that. And, and that will greatly also, we can identify these features and track them in space and time. And they, a lot of the combustion phenomenon of, of interest is not space filling or volume filling. And so you can have huge reduction in the amount of data that you need to keep track of if you can um, capture the salient regions and analyze those relative to the background. <coughs> And so the, um, these are just some images that Janine uh, set up for us that look at um, some of the combustion features of interest. Obviously, one of them is the scalar dissipation rate based on the mixture fraction. This is so critical to what happens in, in non-premixed flames and jet flames, right, with having to do with extinction and reignition type processes and auto ignition. Um, and, and other uh, type, and so characterizing the the shapes, geometry, um, intermittency of these types of features is important. <clears throat> um, and, and there's been work done also uh, by, by Norbert Peters in looking at um, scalar dissipation rate elements, I guess is what he's calling them. 
uh, based on uniform gradient uh, flows. In this case, it would be the gradient of a mixture fraction using more snail type complex um, um, combinatorial topology type method methodology. Uh, and okay, and then once you characterize features, you want to be able to or quantify what it is you're looking for. Then you want to be able to segment them out of this huge database in an efficient parallel manner. And then you want to be able to track them spatially and temporally, either through spatial overlap or through other metrics. For example, you could track particles along with the, uh, with the flow so that you can not only use spatial overlap as a criteria, but also uh, particle trajectories, for example, to be able to connect dots between features at one time and the next. <coughs> so the first study we looked at was how to um, do conditional analysis uh, using uh, global shape characteristics, and, and this came in really handy when we looked. We're looking for this jet, looking at this jet cross flow. So we identified a jet-based coordinate system to allow us to then aggregate conditional averages and, and higher order moments on uh, conditional on the jet plane trajectory. And this is work that Ray Grout um, uh, recently completed, and that is in press in JFM. <coughs> so. Um, some of the challenges here was uh, defining a, a, a jet parameterization based on the um, streamline, mean streamline um, is not necessarily, centerline is not uh, rigorous um, and that the, you know, in a, in a uh, reactive scalar like, like or passive scalar, even like mixture fraction, it has a very irregular shape isocontour. So this is uh, an isocontour corresponding to a low value mixture fraction, I think 0.05, so it's pretty insensitive to what, what you choose, whether it's 0.05 or 0.1. <coughs> and, and so um, we, we take this, uh, I think I answered an earlier question, but we take this ISO value mixture fraction and then we solve the process equation on it, um, it both on the surface and then we impose a finite element mesh inside of that and solve um, from the outside in the process equation to the center line. And so we can identify this jet um, trajectory, which is zero here at the inlet, unity at the exit, and we can bit it up here into like, um, you know, segments, and then we can do our conditional statistics within each of these, conditional on where you are on this jet path polarization. <coughs> okay, so this just has some of the details of that. As I said, simplify, solve the Laplace equation on a simplified jet surface. And then we tetrahedralize the jet interior using TetGen. And then we extend the surface parameterization to the jet interior by solving the Laplace's equation again from the outside in. Um, two parameter values for all group points inside the jet. And then once we have this jet parameterization, jet path parameterization, we can compute conditional statistics. For example, shown here is just the velocity uh, conditional average along that jet path parameter. The second um, way of analyzing data, we find we have lots of small extinction holes or lots of small ignition kernels, especially at the inception point. They're very small and, and, and they, they move quickly through space and time. And so what we're interested in here is to you know, study the relationship between mechanical strain rate, mixing rate, and intermittent extinction reignition events. And then how do you compute, compute feature-based statistical summaries of that information? <clears throat> and what we noted was that all of these kinds of extinction and ignition events are characterized by local um, minima and maxima, so local isovalues um, of, of you know, peaks and valleys. Uh, and so that, that kind of led us to looking at level set methods and um, looking at the topology of, uh, surrounding these local minima and maxima. <clears throat> and and some of the framework, and I'm not a mathematician, so this is my colleague's work, but they're looking at combinatorial topology for defining features um, in scalar data. Um, and this provides, this, this math framework um, allows us to get insights on the behavior of functions, both from contour tree, trees, which lets you determine the level set structure, so, um, and then also from more snail complex, which lets you look at function gradients. Um, and you can then, with this uh, methodology, uh, move up and down on, on threshold values 
and, and looking at their statistics without having to recompute everything. So it does it once and for all for all threshold values. Uh, kind of see if I can draw a Right, because it comes from boundary layer approximation or flamework type approximation, where you have gradients in one significant gradients in one direction that allow you to treat the flame as an infinitesimally thin front and by a threshold value of the level set. And so I think some of these ideas are more uh, physics based. <laughs> but I'm not a this is kind of outside of my areas of expertise. So I have to rely on my colleagues. <coughs> So there's a whole, I just want to point out that there is a lot of rigorous math, combinatorial math, uh, topological math behind how to identify these minimum maxima, particularly if you have noisy data. Not to say that we have noisy data in DNS, but in measurement data that there is. And so this will allow you to rigorously find these local minimum maxima. And <clears throat> so here's an example of, of uh, if you think about um, uh, ignition kernels that in, in a, point in time that have evolved spatially to different levels. And so now imagine that you're looking down uh, at a bunch of mountain peaks, right, that represent different Gaussian levels of some temperature or intermediate radical. And you want to sweep from the max, global maximum value down to the minimum value. And as you do that sweep, you can identify local maxima and local minima. And you can uh, kind of represent that in terms of these um, merge trees that are represented by these little circles and then the lines drawn. And so as you sweep down, you grow a larger region around these local minima and maxima, right? So here I'm sweeping down these uh, local minima and maxima that I identify, the top peaks are picked out and then you grow regions around them. And then as they intersect, they form saddle points, which are shown by the length of those green and red, different colored encoded um, uh, lines. And then they meet at a saddle point and you can continue that sweep until <clears throat> in that encoding of that information in the merge tree until you've got reached your global minima in, the, in your data set. And so you, this merge tree um, information kind of parameterizes the connectivity between the local minima and maxima, say these are extinction or emission type levels. So you can do that through your data. And similarly to the merge tree, for um, level sets, you can do that also when you're represent looking at uniform gradient region uh, regions. And I think this is similar to what Norbert Peters was doing when he was looking at dissipation elements uh, for, for mixture fraction dissipation rate. So rather than looking at, at region of constant level set here, you're looking at uh, regions that have uniform gradients. <coughs> um, and so again, you can partition these into either ascending or de descending manifolds and and identify localized regions um, that, are, that have uniform gradient flow. And so if we, um, the, some of these tools, they pre-compute all these merge trees and, and, and um, contour trees and, the, and all the metadata associated with that. And so you can encode um, multi-resolution hierarchies and statistics associated with that drastically reduce the amount of data. So you can think about, once I segment out a region, I can compute conditional statistics inside or outside of that particular feature or classes of features that have similar shape or geometric properties. Um, and so it allows you, and then you can encode that and you can change your threshold value or your criterion. You don't have to redo the whole thing. It's all encoded once and for all in this. And you can interactively explore the data uh, and <coughs> accumulate um, aggregate, aggregate your feature-based spatial and temporal statistics on the fly. And then another useful thing that um, is, is that you can link the views. So you can actually do volume views of specific features and then at the same time look at feature statistics. So here's a cumulative histogram of 
of something, like let's say temperature. And if I if I want to look at where some part of the statistic originated from, I can point on on the visualization, and that will actually link me back to physical space and show me where where that occurred. And so I can and that that's helpful to link um, phase space or statistical information back to the original flow or flame flame feature. Um, okay. And then I just want to say that the kinds of this, uh, statistics that we are computing now on these um, segmented features include the minimum, maximum, first through the fourth order moments of the scalars and velocities, and various length scales. So we can look at the, how thick a dissipation layer is, how long it is, and how wide it is relative to, say, Kolmogorov or Taylor length scales. <coughs> and, and these are some of these length scales are computed for, versus spectral uh, methods that look at um, different non-trivial eigenvectors. So, let's see. And then I've already pointed this out, looking at cross-link statistics and feature viewers um, help you look at causality. Um, and the framework that, that these guys have developed helps us um, explore large data using just your laptop or your workstation on commodity hardware. You don't have to have a supercomputer in order to actually do some of this analysis. And so they actually demonstrated they could do the simulation with half a billion grid points and 230 time steps, reducing the data uh, from a terabyte down to 14 gigabytes on a, um, on a, on a local cluster. And, um, and these are some of the reported times. So this is a species distribution plots time series obtained in about a second of time. Um, and feature browsers, you could actually interactively look at about 12 to 25 frames a second. <coughs> this third one is once you have segmented features, either through level sets or uniform gradient flows, this is a, actually a, of an auto ignition in an HCCI case where we're looking at methyl radical in the left most image. And then what we've done is segment out um, uh, threshold of, I forget what percentage of the peak methyl radical, and so these are the features at a given time snapshot. And then we've tracked those features in time through the contour tree, um, and it's noted by the white lines. But, uh, actually, it's a reef graph, a reef tracking graph, so that we've encoded their space and time location of all of these features as they merge or form, um, split, or die. And so then you can actually look at the Lagrangian evolution of these fluid parcels, not as a point, but actually as a non-local feature. So we apply this to the lifted co-flowing ethylene air jet plane to understand the relationships between multiple scalar fields. And shown here, for example, is a hydroxyl radical uh, indicating the lifted plane. In red, um, the scalar dissipation rate of mixture fraction. In blue, these are these sheet-like structures oriented with the principal strain direction. And then the ignition kernels, we chose HO2 to, and their um, P, uh, local maximum to identify the ignition uh, events. <coughs> so these are have been segmented. And, um, and then, OK, so then here, this is just the scalar dissipation rate by itself, along with some of the smaller ignition kernels in the near field. And on the right is just the HO2 ignition kernel. So you can see the very small, um, small localized regions that are fast appearing, disappearing, and, and moving. Uh, and see, here are some different slices through that data, so you can see their spatial orientation from different in view span and different cuts uh, where the kernel lives relative to the dissipation rate. And then we tried to track these kernels um, as, they, as they form upstream of the plane and eventually merge with the lifted plane base. And so <clears throat> what's shown here is just a small sample of, of one of these um, merging and splitting events. This is a tracking graph, uh, the read graph that I talked about earlier. And I'm tracking um, in gold a small ignition, isolated ignition kernel as it moves upstream. And, and so the flow here is issuing from left to right which previously, as I showed you, was up to down, or down from bottom up. Now I've turned the flame on the side. <clears throat> and the lifted flame base is shown by the red um, threshold of OH, I think of 5 e minus 4 uh, in these pictures here. And then this is just tracking one bit of 
ignition caramel was shown in gold. And as it gets close to the flame base, if you look closely it, uh, in time, it first splits here, so it divides, and, it, and that division is captured in the tracking graph here. This is a feature at, at some time step, and then subsequent time step it splits into two branches. And then following that, the, the bit that split eventually merges with the flame base. Uh, the gold uh, eventually uh, merges with that red flame base, and you can see the merge happening at this time here, where the red part of the reef graph is just tracking some bits on the flame base itself. And so you can see the flame base bit merged with the kernel, kernel that formed upstream. And so you can start to do this in an automated way through all of your data and look at looking at or you know where where these kernels form, uh, how they merge, how they grow in size, and how they maybe are dissipated or die, vanish, right? <clears throat> and then you can most importantly compute statistics following these kernels. And a lot of the I think a lot of the time history and intermittency kinds of things you need to have cumulative uh, time history in order to understand. Um, what's going on. Okay, this is just a, another depiction of this, maybe from a, a better view of that same process I described, moving from left, flows left to right. Here's a kernel. New kernel formed here. It's born here. It wasn't there previously. And, and then later on, this kernel, let's see, this kernel merges with that yellow bit, and then it splits, and then it that, that split bit then merges with the flame base. So there's all these dynamics that are going on. Um, another thing that people are looking at now are what they call attributed relational graphs. And so multiple types of features, um, different scalars or scalar velocity can be tracked in both space and time, and their attributes can be tracked in space and time. So you can actually cross-correlate uh, features in, in terms of their properties um, and how and then aggregate the statistics or other similar patterns uh, of those types of statistics that occur in your database. I don't want to say anything more about it because this is not my uh, area of expertise. <coughs> so one comment I'd like to make is going from peta to exascale uh, is problematic uh, in the sense that um, you know, we typically expect about a 10x increase in spatial resolution with every thousand-fold increase in compute capability, and that happens about once every 10 years. But this won't happen this, this next time uh, for several reasons. One, we won't have a thousand-fold increase in memory. Memory is only going to increase by uh, 33, 34-fold uh, compared to flops, which is a thousand-fold. Um, processor speeds are fixed. There are um, processor you see now will be largely the same uh, uh, frequent uh, hertz that you see uh, for exascale machine. They won't be 10 times faster. And therefore, to get the higher, uh, to get to exaflop, we have to have much higher concurrency. We're going to have to have like a billion processors. So think about your laptop now with dual core or quad core. Think about a thousand core on a, on a, on a node. And then think about another thousand or 10,000 nodes across the whole machine. It's a lot of, a lot of processors. <clears throat> and then what's really irritating and um, potentially a showstopper is that we won't be able to move as much data on or off each processor because it costs energy. It costs picojoules, lots of picojoules to move data around. And the further you move it, the more energy it takes. And we don't want to have a nuclear power plant powering our supercomputer. <laughs> so the power constraints and that equates to cost, is that you know maybe we're going to have a computer that consumes four or five times as much power as we have today, but it can't, it can't be a lot more. And so that, that means we have to, uh, if our current metric is floating point operations per second, flops, right? What's your peak flop, what percentage of peak do you get with your code? The, the metric of the future is, is going to be how much energy did you burn to make that computation or some combination of flops and energy. And then, <clears throat> OK, so um, and I should say it's not only to move data on or off each processor. It's also within a node how far you have to move one, one uh, 
you know, if they have a thousand processors on a node, how far they're apart, either vertically or horizontally in terms of locality, but also to move data off to a spinning disk. Mechanical disk is a major, there's major limitations. So historically, all of our, a lot of our analysis and visualization has been performed as a post-processing step. Um, there are huge I.O. restrictions. I.O. will not keep pace with the increase in computing power. It simply, it just can't. Not enough, uh, they, they want to put the money into memory and, and to, mostly into memory and other parts of the machine and, and so there's not going to be much I.O. We're going to go to trickle out just a fraction of the amount of data that we produce even today. So as a consequence, <coughs> we're going to have to do a lot of what we currently do as a post step. We have to, we have to do it in situ or on the fly. And run our computations a lot like we run our large scale experiments. You get one shot at it. You better get out what you want or all the derived variables that you think you're going to want to derive from later on because you won't be able to save all the data. And so we, we have, we're motivated to then think about how, how to do analysis differently. Uh, we, and some of the concurrent in situ analysis challenges become, how do we share data structures between the simulation and analysis codes, which are inherently a lot of times different. So for example, the topology-based algorithms are largely tree or graph-based algorithms, whereas PDE solvers are, are, have a very different data structure, right? We, uh, so how do those actually share the same memory space and efficiently and, and so on becomes a real computer science challenge. Um, so developing scalable methods constrained to simulation data partitioning. Because you don't want to be restructuring your arrays every time you have to move from analysis to solver. Oh, okay. Is that like time to quit? <laughs> Soon, all right. And so, um, the other factor, key factor, is we have to develop methods that run on a very small fraction of simulation time. So some of the steps for analysis of this you can do in situ on the same process as you're doing your solve, but other bits are very costly and it's impossible to reduce their expense. So you want to do that in transit in a hybrid mode. So you're moving data asynchronously off to, into a, a temporary staging area or into a secondary compute resource and, and finishing the analysis there. And so this is just an example of in situ visualization that was done recently on the volume memory of several species of particles, where it only took 1% of the overall simulation time on 15,000 processors. And the image compositing, uh, which is a very different algorithm than PDE solve, was done using the same shared data structure as the DNS code. <coughs> um, and this is more, on, I'll skip this one in the interest of time. What we want to end up with is robust tracking of features with, that have very short time scales like extinction ignition, where sometimes if you just look for spatial overlap in saved restart files, you're going to jump over and not be able to connect them in time. Whereas if you do it in situ, you have all the information there. You can track in time, for example, these small scale intermittent features in space and time by doing it in situ. And as I said, we're looking at in situ, hybrid approaches of doing parts of the analysis is on the same set of processes part of it in transit uh, through a staging area that separates the solvers from the analysis part. Okay, I'll skip this. Uh, as part of um, working with the computer science folks who are designing future architectures, they have their DNS of computer architectures where they have an abstract machine model and then they can simulate the behavior of machines that don't exist today. And if we match those up with the algorithms that we expect to use for our PDE solve and for our analysis, we can start to do trade-off studies between you know, the speeds and feeds and how much memory, how much non-volatile RAM and other types of flash memory, for example, we need to install in this machine to be optimal for our uh, combustion analysis. Um, <coughs> okay, this is just more on the structural simulation toolkit that the CS guys are using for both within a node, internode, and internode architectural simulations to design the topology as well as the, 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 the memory and, and chips on the node. Um, and they look at things like bandwidth, latency, noise, imbalance, resource contention. What happens if you have um, failures? You're going to have failures when you have a billion weight concurrency a lot, much more frequently than we do now. So you have to worry about resilience of your algorithm 
Uh, if, if you uh, parts of your algorithm go down, can you, you know, do you recompute or do you just keep going? Uh, we also have to develop new uh, programming models. So MPI, we looked with MPI for 20 years, right? Before that, it was vector uh, vectorized um, code. So what's what are, what's going to happen in the future when you have such large parallelism and, and such deep memory architectures, and, and you have to deal with data locality? Are there new programming model paradigms that will help you with that? For example, people are looking at OpenMP, MPI, and looking at CUDA when you have um, heterogeneous architectures that have accelerators on it, or people are looking at compilers that have pragmas or directives like OpenACC now, which is starting to become a standard to help you uh, help you um, program on these accelerators. Because you don't want to be writing CUDA code at the lowest level, you know, if you want to also have time to do the physics and the science. <coughs> um, so this, this is just a list of references for some of the um, the level set topology work and for doing concurrent analysis. And then I just want to just want to briefly point out the technology scaling for exascale systems. Comparing 2010 or 2012 what we have today with where we're going to be uh, by 2018-2020, you see that the power increase we're allowed based on cost constraints is only a factor three increase. Um, yet the um, uh, Let's see, the um, memory is only going to go up by a factor of 33, and um, the storage, the I.O., is only going to go up by a factor of 20. And so these, there's some great disparities in the, in, in the um, changes in different parts of the machine architecture that have to be dealt with. And so some of the biggest challenges that we are facing in designing our algorithms are going to be parallelism. As I said, billion-way parallelism. Something's going to fail every 24 hours or less. Mean time failure rate is going to be much higher. Data movement, you want to move data as minimally as you can, which speaks to higher order um, methods. You want to go uh, higher order finite difference, higher, uh, AMR, higher order. Do more floating point operations, but move data around less. Keep it in memory. Um, how do you program these types of machines? You know, there's probably new programming paradigms coming online that we're not aware of or are being developed right now in the computer science community. And then resiliency, you know, you're gonna have to have um, all sorts of redundancy measures for when parts of the machine fail. And this is just a slide showing the need for data locality, which shows the amount <coughs> of energy that's consumed for operation, picajoules for operation on different parts of the system. And the only thing I want to point out, this is on a log scale, is that um, communication both within a node and across nodes is 10 orders of magnitude more expensive than communicating on ship. So, Whenever possible, you want to uh, conserve energy, you want to keep your data local. Okay, and this is just another slide showing that the total concurrency in order to reach an exit block is going to go to a billion, billion chip, a billion processors to get there. Not, and so that's a lot to, to have to keep track of. Um, okay, and then last, I guess, um, well, let me, let me just conclude. Uh, if, you're, if you're interested in looking more at these exascale issues, I advise you to go to our website, www.exactcodesign.org. Our goal here is to co-design both the combustion science requirements that influence uh, computer architecture design and technology constraints that inform the design of our PDE and, and, and analysis algorithms and solvers. And we're developing a compressible and low box number high order adaptive mesh refinement code. Uh, this is together with John Bell at Lawrence Berkeley Labs. We're also inc including in this work in situ uncertainty quantification using adjoint sensitivities and polynomial chaos expansion uh, in these, uh, through looking at the uh, effects of, um, of uh, uncertainties and rate parameters in the chemistry models um, to macroscopic heat release and emissions type quantity. And then finally, we're looking at institute topological analytics and visualization. So I'll stop here, because I don't have time to go into all the co-design part. Uh, a lot of this is in the notes. But I want to point out then what we can do if we're successful at going to exascale in the future. So if we can do all of this computer science well, what, what, what's the potential for computational combustion science on, an, on, let's say, even tomorrow at the end of the year on a 20 petawatt hybrid machine, we can increase the chemical kinetic complexity 
and especially focusing on low temperature, high pressure kinetics and its coupling with the turbulent mixing. You know, on the order of uh, about 100 species now is feasible in, in turbulent 3D DNS. <coughs> and, and looking at some of these um, low temperature, high pressure effects with bio, surrogate biodiesel fuels with isooctane and heptane methanol. And then the second orthogonal axis is we really want to still increase our Reynolds number and move up in pressure. And so uh, maintaining simple, simpler or not increasing the chemical complexity, we can increase the dynamic range of our fluid mechanical scale by increasing our, increasing our mesh size. So we should be able to get to Reynolds numbers on the order of 50,000 or so, um, not too far off. So I'll stop here.